Good morning, everybody. I'm Chris Jones. I'm with the University of Arizona in Gila County. Um, today, we are doing the Garden and Country Extension webinar series. We've got Bill Cook with us from over in Greenlee County. He's going to be talking to us about seed saving. So just a little bit about our, these webinars. Um, I call them the uh, Garden and Country Extension webinar series. We, it's a weekly event. We come together Thursdays at 11, try to keep it under an hour. I'll go ahead and shut down the video uh, at the top of the hour, but if we still got questions for Bill, as long as he's willing to hang out with us, sure. he'll answer the questions. He's, he's great yeah. that way. Um, we feature a variety of horticultural and natural resource topics relevant to the environmental conditions and residential concerns of Gila County and any place else in the world that has the same interest. A recording will be posted at uh, extension.arizona.edu slash Gila, or you can email me at ckjonesarizona.edu. We also have a YouTube channel that these all get posted to, and that's kind of the first, first thing. And my comp, camp, campus colleague has been pretty good about getting those up even by, before the week's over. Um, and the University of Arizona is an equal opportunity, affirmative action institution. And with that, I am going to run our affirmative action poll. So let me hit that. Launch. This is anonymous. So if you would just take a, a moment, answer those three questions how you wish. Um, I'll leave that up as I finish up the introduction, and then we'll take that down when Bill starts up. Okay, so back to my slides. Our presenter today is Bill Cook. He's with the University of Arizona Cooperative Extension. He is the Greenlee County Master Gardener Program Coordinator. So welcome, Bill. Well, howdy. <laughs> howdy, it's good to have you with us today. It's always good to be with you guys. So I'm, I'm glad you're, I'm glad to be here and glad you asked. Yeah, so. it's, it seems like you're getting a, a good, clear um, discussion with me. I can hear you well, so oh, I, don't good. Know, I don't think we'll be dealing with those bandwidth issues we, we were talking about. Yeah, well, I think our Wi-Fi might have just decided to wake up. <laughs> Perfect timing. <laughs> yeah, good timing on uh, behalf of the Wi-Fi. <laughs> yeah. Well, Please take over the, the slideshow and it's all yours. Thank you, Bill. Okie dokie. So today we're going to talk a little bit about seed saving. And I really think seed saving for any of us that enjoy gardening, uh, seed saving is one of the best things we can do. I really wish I had discovered it much sooner. Um, there, it's uh, just a wonderful thing. You know, a lot of people right off the top, well, you know, I spend so much money on seeds. Well, you can save some money. But there's so much more you can do with seed saving than just save a buck or two. So I am gonna put on, we're gonna just kind of skip through this slideshow here. I, I haven't seen it come up yet, Bill. Yeah, I'm, I'm getting there. Okay. I'm gonna kind of skip through this slideshow and we're just gonna hit on the, on the finer points. The slideshow is actually aimed at a, a much longer class, which we're gonna be doing over here on Saturday. So um, obviously you can save a buck or two. Uh, availability of varieties. I'm sure anybody that's gardened more than three years has probably planted something that did really well and they really liked it. And they go back to the garden center next year and they can't find seeds. You know, that's a pretty common occurrence. So saving seeds helps with that. One of the, the big ones to me is improving the varieties. You know, you can do, you can improve a variety so fast. It, you, you would just be amazed. So, uh oh, what are we doing here? We put this on slideshow. Now my computer is being a slow poke. Well, maybe it won't go on slideshow. It's getting there. It's just a big file. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're just, right. oh, excuse me one moment. <laughs> Norman, right at this moment. <laughs> <laughs> oh, 
Okay. So anyways, I guess we'll just go with uh, the slide here that's up. So this slide, it's kind of interesting. And I got this from the fine folks at the Seed Library up in Flagstaff. I don't recall their names, but they gave me this slide and let me use it. So, oh, here it goes, doing something. <laughs> okay, so on the top of this, you can see this is the number of varieties that were available in seed catalogs in 1903. We'll just go all the way there to the left and we'll look at beets. There were 288 varieties of beet available. 1983, we're down to 17. And uh, as it says there at the left, the economics of commercial seed production, you know, it favors fewer and fewer. And of course, one of the things also involved is that uh, the seed companies primarily cater to commercial agriculture. So oftentimes what we wind up with in the, uh, in the seed aisle is the same thing that, that they're growing commercially, which in a lot of cases, this stuff has been bred for shipping and handling qualities, for appearance, that sort of thing, but not nearly so much for flavor. Um, and this is where sharing seeds around, sharing with your buddies, you know, you'll find somebody that has an old family heirloom uh, we have a, a pepper here, a sweet pepper that I got from a guy at the farmer's market in Camp Verde. He gave me some seeds. When his family moved to Camp Verde from Oklahoma, they had been growing these peppers in Oklahoma and they brought the seeds with them and had been growing them in Camp Verde for 50 years. It's the most amazing pepper you've ever eaten, but there's nothing quite like it on the market. So, you know, this is the kind of thing that you can do with seed sharing. You can start bringing back some of these little few remaining old family heirlooms. And hopefully someday we can bring those 1983 numbers back up. Um, used to be that the smaller seed companies catered to a local need, um, you know, much the same way as we see heirloom everything, heirloom tomatoes, heirloom fruit. It's something that just did well in a specific area. It was very acclimated to a specific area. Um, and of course, with the bigger seed companies and selling nationwide, that's not really a happening thing anymore. So saving the old varieties is a good thing. Uh, another thing while you're saving, it's surprising if you save, say, Anaheim's or jalapenos or something like that, you save your seed from the best plant and plant that your best two or three plants. Um, plant them again next year, save from the best. Within just a few short years, uh, you can improve a variety. I mean, it's impressive how quick it happens. And of course, this is one of my favorite pictures, you know, from selective seed saving. Um, Look at that watermelon. <laughs> yeah, selective seed saving, you know, the foundation of genetic improvement and local adaptation. So this is one of the benefits of saving your own seeds as well. When you're saving your own, real quick look, this is our seed library. It's easy to have enough seed to share with people. So you know, what, what are the keys to seed saving? Um, selecting suitable plants, suitable pollination methods. This is a picture of uh, hand pollinating some squash. Squash cross quite easily. You can see, you just put a clothespin over that blossom before it opens up. When it's ready to rock and roll, you take the clothespin off, you hand pollinate, you put the clothespin back on. It's as easy as that. Um, and there are so many other plants that you don't even have to do that. Uh, beans, tomatoes, most chilies, which I had hoped to get some nice blossoms that I could hold up in front of the camera, but I wasn't quite able to do that this morning. So when you're seed saving, Make sure that something is pollinated and not crossed. Make sure that it's ripe. 
Uh, you know, we eat um, cucumbers, very green. You can chew the seeds. Well, obviously that is not right. Uh, a pumpkin, you know, you wait till it's orange, summer squash. You wait until they're ripe. Well, those seeds are ready. But so many of the things we eat, green peppers, you, you, and I've tried it because I wasn't real convinced, but uh, green peppers, you'll get a few. You'll have a very low germination rate, but if you wait until they turn red, you're going to have great germination. I mean, it's not unusual to get 90 plus percent germination on our saved seeds. Um, so, yeah, you, you, you know, clean them and dry them. That's the next step. There's countless ways of doing that. Uh, and we'll get into that a little bit. But the, the very foundation of the whole thing is the plants that we start with. So, so that's kind of the, the overview. If you're purchasing seeds, um, what you're looking for here on the top, you'll see Cocazelle. You go down there and it says open pollinated or heirloom. So open pollinated or heirloom is suitable for seed saving. You know, that's, that is, um, that's oftentimes, you know, an heirloom and of course heirloom being, I think 50 years old plus. Well, uh, obviously that's open pollinated because that was how they did it 50 years ago. But the main thing is that these are, are stable varieties um, from pollination between same or genetically similar parents. The genetics are right there. And again, you'll wanna grow several to save seed from, to keep a little genetic diversity. The other reason you'll wanna grow several is you'll only wanna save seeds from the best plant. And right there is the reason why I prefer to wait until September to start saving seeds. Oops, it moved. Um, usually by September, you know, you have, you have uh, six purple calabash out there. You're gonna find that there's one or two that did, they dawdle. You have one or two that did okay. And then you're gonna have one or two that did great. So you're gonna to wanna to save the seeds from those. So by September, you'll know which plants are the best. Then by September, you will still have uh, that window of opportunity to allow the fruit to ripen. Something that pollinates today, like on a tomato, for example, is gonna be ripe when the weather's warm, 30, 35 days. If we get a cool snap, it could go 40, even 45. But in any case, we still have enough growing season left before frost. So that's my, my uh, reason for doing this in September with my open pollinated or heirloom varieties. So now we, we drop down here. This is the same seed catalog. And this is a seed company that I like because they tell you, you get this information. And this is Nichols. Um, a lot of seed catalogs, they just have a variety. It does not say, is this open pollinated? Is it a hybrid? So, you know, I, uh, I, I choose to give my business to nurseries that provide me with this information. Because if you, if you don't have this information, you may be spitting in the wind, maybe. So once you got these plants going, and as I said before, pick your fruit from the best plant. So a lot of your plants in the garden are annuals, most of them. And that means that they go from seed to, to grow flower and produce seed again in one year. Um, other plants in your garden, like beets and carrots, onions, they're a biennial, which means it takes them two years to produce seed. And this has caused a lot of uh, confusion with some of our, our seed library patrons. You know, they'll call me up and they'll go, Bill, you know, I planted those beets in the spring, I picked a bunch, 
I left three or four, nothing ever happened. Never got a blossom, never got a seed. Well, that's because a beet is biennial. One of the more interesting conversations I had was somebody who had cut open a pile of carrots and was not finding seeds in any of them. Um, again, a carrot is a biennial and it produces its seed in a flower stalk on top. So that's, that's an important thing there. So we'll skip. So here's a tomato. And one of the reasons that I say a tomato is an easy seed saver, you can see that the stamens here, I don't know if you can see my cursor, they're fused. And if you go out there in your garden and you look, you'll see, it looks like a little cone. So the stamens are fused. The stigma is inside of that enclosed area, which means that unless you perform some surgery to separate those stamens, there's no way for any other pollen to get in there. And you can do that if you're wanting to cross them. Um, you can cut them off before they produce pollen. It gets pretty tricky and I've myself never really thought it was worth the bother when I had so many good tomatoes already. But this is one of the confusing things about pollinating uh, tomatoes. You know, an insect does not disperse the pollen as it would on a cucumber. When a bee lands on it, if you watch, they'll buzz. They'll flutter their little wings and buzz. Well, what they're doing is they're shaking the pollen loose inside there. Um, and when they refer to tomatoes being um, pollinated by the wind, the wind shakes the blossom. It shakes the pollen loose inside, which, which then enters the stigma and fertilizes the ovules. Um, some people might have heard the old wives' tale. If your tomato is blooming and not setting fruit, you, you beat it with a broom. That was what my grandmother said and all her friends. And I'm sure there's many versions of that. But that's, that's the thing. One of, our, uh, one of our volunteers over here, Connie Waddell, is growing tomatoes indoors and she uses her electric toothbrush. She turns on the electric toothbrush and just touches it to the blossom. It shakes the pollen and it pollinates and now she's getting tons of fruit. So that's an important thing to know when you're saving seed or even if you're just wanting tomatoes to set. So another easy seed saver that we have here is beans. And you'll see I highlighted that keel petal. That keel petal is folded pretty tight. And by the same token, the pollen shakes loose inside of that area in that open cavity and pollinates the beans. So it's very, very rare that beans will cross. Um, another one, and I don't have a picture, uh, peppers. Y'all have seen when peppers bloom, how, how you've got your, your ray petals on the outside, and then there are these other little petals. It looks almost like a popcorn in the middle that kind of slowly comes open. Well, if you start looking, by the time that opens up, usually the fruit is beginning to form there in the center. So these smaller petals more or less prevent any cross-pollination. So peppers are extremely easy to save seed from. So that's, that's the easy ones. Um, then, then we have our separate male and female flowers on the same plant. There's a squash, male blossom, female blossom. And pretty much all the cucurbits look like that, cucumbers, cantaloupes, you'll see some of the blossoms have a little tiny fruit there at the bottom and some of them don't. And a lot of times, you know, your zucchini will bloom for quite some time before you see any fruit. Well, if you start looking real close, you'll see that sometimes the darn things will start off with just male blossoms. Mm -hmm. And a lady called me the other day, hers was producing only female blossoms. Um, in a case like that, if you have female blossoms without any male blossoms, you can always go borrow some male blossoms from one of your neighbors and hand pollinate if you have to. Uh, corn, 
the tassel up there produces the pollen and the corn down here is the female blossom. So the pollen falls down there and pollinates and you wanna make sure and get an ample supply of pollen on those silks because every silk is attached to a seed. So um, there are different methods that you can use to prevent cross-pollination, uh, its exclusion. You can see up here on the top, somebody is putting paper bags over the corn blossoms so that they can ensure no foreign poll uh, pollen gets in there. Uh, down here on the bottom left, people sometimes build little tents and hand pollinate. A uh, little tent, what works good for that is floating row cover. Down here on the right, somebody used a little piece of tape I myself have taken using clothespins for that detail because I found sometimes taking the tape off, I damage the blossom to the point that I'm not able to close it again. So that's uh, hand pollination. And again, you can see up here in the left, this guy has, this tool is actually made to do what Connie Waddell's toothbrush does. It vibrates the blossoms in a greenhouse. Um, you can take a brush, a little brush, and you can go between plants. I've had a, a few spells with a shortage of bees, and I've gone out on my cucumbers with a brush and just gone blossom to blossom to blossom, you know, just go down the row and hand pollinate them. And I found that there is an additional benefit to that, is that you're hand pollinating the blossoms that are in a convenient location, which then puts your cucumbers in a convenient location. So that was like, woohoo, bonus, right? Or in the case of the cucurbits, pumpkin, squash, that sort of thing, you can just take a male blossom, you can peel off the, the petals and just insert it into the female blossom and just kind of swish it around. Um, this is one of the main confusions of people, I've had people tell me that they think their cucumbers must have cross-pollinated their cantaloupes because their cantaloupes taste washed out. That's not really how it works. Um, cross-pollination will not affect the current crop. It will only affect the seeds and the following year's crop. And down here is an example of a cross and how many variations came forth from that. So. Uh, saving seed from cross-pollinated squash, you really don't know for sure what you're going to get. So once you get your seed saved, simple seed cleaning tools. I use a little uh, strainer a whole lot. Um, some things that are dry, you can just tap seeds out like okra. Uh, you can just tap them out into a container and, you're, and they're good to go. And anyways, there is a multitude, everything from the most complicated and fancy to the simplest ways. Uh, anything you do is fine as long as you get them clean. Dry them well, spread them out. That's one of the things I've got in a hurry and not dried them enough and had problems with mold. So storing them, there's countless ways of storing them. There's a graph here. Uh, I usually use a paper bag, and that seems to be kind of the time-honored method. Uh, or for things that I store a lot of, like beans, I just go ahead and put them in a canning jar and just screw the lid on kind of loose. And they keep for a long time. Now, longevity of seeds is uh, it's, uh, it's an interesting subject because there's a lot of authorities out there with, um, you know, with numbers. The bottom line is that the longer you store them, you just start to get a reduced, oh, doorman time. I don't know. We have a little 4-H traffic today. Um, anyways, where I was going, the older they get, like seeds that I collected last year, say we're talking corn. 
um, I'll probably get a 99% germination rate on that seed. And the easiest way that I have found to dry corn seeds is just leave them on the stock till the whole stock, everything gets dry. So now those same corn seeds, I put them away and forget about them and find them five years later and plant them. Well, I might be down to an 80%. So the germination rate simply declines over time. Uh, I know a lot, I've seen people throw out seed that was five years old as if it was a light switch. Oh, five years, they're done. And it's just not how it works. I have a, a cousin over in uh, Camp Verde area that some years ago, um, he's a gardener, gardener extraordinaire, and he was given some seed from an Indian ruin and asked to try to reproduce that seed. And he had a couple of clay pots that were sealed with a clay, you know, just an adobe lid just smashed into it. So I forget the number of seeds. There was like 2000 seeds and he only got 12 plants, but those seeds were estimated at 700 years old. So if you have some old seed and you just want to give it a shot, you know, don't be shy about it. What the heck? Go ahead and try because those, those dozen or so plants uh, that Eric got out of those clay pots actually produced, you know, and he was selective about it. He saved some. And now those same seeds, there's enough for everybody. So um, that's the rundown on doing the seed saving part of it. So I will skip ahead here or over here. We did a couple of quick videos that I'd like to show you, and then we're we're ready for, for questions. So here we go there. So Bill, we may may need you. Oh, there it is. Okay. Yeah. So, so anyway, we just did some real, real quick. You know, I'm one of those people, I've got to see it to really get it. And I figure, well, there's probably some more like me out there. So this this will be real quick and easy. And we went ahead and threw these on our, this is our uh, seed libraries, Facebook. So let's see, let me turn that on. Okay, we're gonna do a little bit of wet processing. We're saving some seeds. Um, this is for things like tomatoes, cucumbers, that sort of thing, melons. There's a lot of ways to do your tomato seeds. I like this one because it's done, it's over. So we start by squishing the seeds out into that strainer, like so. Then we put them under the water and we rub. And this gets the, the gooey stuff off of them. You just kind of force it through the, through the strainer. Now, I know a lot of people like to do their tomatoes other ways. Uh, what I consider the advantage to this method is that one time you're done. You don't have to remember to go strain them out of a jar or something like that and wash them again. So you just keep going and you can see that the slime is disappearing. And that slime needs to be gone because it's kind of sugary. It can mold that sort of thing, but it does need to be off because its function is to delay the germination of that seed waiting for warm weather in the spring. So it needs to come off. And this, this same thing works, like I say, for anything that requires wet processing. So you wash the stuff off and eventually they're clean like this. You spread them out on a plate or something, let them dry a couple weeks, stick them in a paper envelope, and you're done. So this is wet processing. Okay, so that is wet processing. And let's see. Well, wet processing. Hmm, there should be one here for dry processing. Let me see, yeah, dry processing. No, I don't want to watch it again. I want to play it.
Well, let's see what we have here. Oh, this is when is it ready? Maybe. I'm sure you can tell I'm a real uh, computer whiz. Crunchy and crispy because the bean that we use for a stir fry or a pot of beans is not ready. So now we're gonna look at these different things and what is actually right for seeds. Um, most of the things we eat, the seeds are not really ripe enough to grow. Seeds have to get totally ripe. Tomatoes, they need to be ripe enough to drip off your chin. Beans, peas, that sort of thing in the pod, they need to be crunchy and crispy because the bean that we use for a stir fry or a pot of beans is not ready to go. Chilies, they need to be, and peppers, they need to be completely red, ripe, except for varieties that ripen to orange or yellow. Bell peppers, same thing. So here's a cucumber. This is an Armenian cucumber. This is how we eat them. This is one that has ripe seeds. And if you're in doubt, you can take some of those seeds out and they need to be hard, like hard so you cannot chew them. And this would apply to summer squash as well. So you can always try biting one and it's too hard to chew. Well, those are ready to go. So now we can take those out, wet process them, dry them, and they're good to go. Whereas the seeds in this one will never germinate. Okay. So now we're going to look at these different oh. things and what is actually right for seeds. Well, okay. When is it ready? Well, I think our seed library Facebook is off somewhere. Uh, <laughs> most of the things we eat, the seeds are not really ripe enough. I think we said that already, didn't we? Let's see. Dry processing. Okay, we've done a little bit of wet processing. Now we're going to do some dry processing. Dry processing is for things like uh, beans and peas, chili peppers, that sort of thing. So you can see this is this is beans the way that we would eat them. Stir fry. These ones here, we could shell them into a pot, cook them with a little bacon. But these are completely dry and the, the pod snaps. So it's pretty darn easy with the beans. You just take them out of the, out of the pod. And if they're good and dry, they're ready to go. You can store those in a paper bag if you want. But you want to wait until the pod is brittle as opposed to green. Something like this, the seed is not ripe and it will never grow. So we'll move over here to chili peppers. So this is a, this is a um, Midnight Dreams bell pepper. It's purple, but that's how we eat it. Well, this is ripe enough for seed. Same thing. We have a jalapeno, the way we eat it. This is where it needs to go to be ripe for seeds. Um, Mia Orange, Anaheim's. So to process your chili seeds, what we do is we cut it open and we take out the seeds. And again, we just spread them out on this plate like this and let them dry for a couple of weeks. And then we put them in a paper envelope and they're good to go. Um, nice thing about chilies, you can dry the pods before you take the seeds out. You've got a lot of leeway here. I know people that just cut them out like that and let the seeds dry in the air and you're good to go. So that is dry processing. There we go. Oh. Well, thank you very much, Bill. Yeah. I 
appreciate that and learn some things too, as I hope our listeners. <laughs> um, well, good. Yeah. So let's open this up for some questions. Go ahead and type what you are got for Bill in the Q&A or in the chat box. Um, I appreciated your discussion on helping tomatoes to germinate, to, uh, to yeah. pollinate. And I was just wondering if there's a certain time of day that is more effective than another. Uh, wind, obviously. No, no, I mean, if you're going to be doing it yourself, the morning, the afternoon, is there any time of day that that pollen is present? Well, yeah. I would say probably the morning because when it gets over what, 92, um, I think they're, the pollen's no longer viable. So get out in the morning when you can see blooms. And yeah, I'm hearing out. some background. Is my screen still sharing noise or? I heard a little something, but it doesn't seem too bad. Maybe I've still got. Well, while you're the doing things. that, that's, it seems like it happens when I'm talking. Let me yeah. see if there's something I need to do. No, I cut that off. Hmm. Yeah, because I think I think my Facebook has gone to another thing. And I think we're hearing some stupid Facebook banter. You you should be able to close that that window. That, that was an accident. I didn't mean that. And, and, here, and here, look, here, let's, let's, I, let's, let's grab that part. No, hey, Peter, just hold yeah, on that. Close that tab. Hey, you're yeah. recording all of this. I know. Here, how do we shut this hold thing the up? Hold that there, there we go. How do I close that page? Good. There you go. Push that there we go. Now it's gone. Yeah. Okay. Now, now it's, it's gone. gone. <laughs> yeah. My my computer literacy is showing its re rearing its ugly head. <laughs> well, we appreciate what you know in the garden, and that's why we're here. Yeah, that's right. right. Guys? <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> so here's some of the questions coming up. And Susan says, great information, great presentation. Jan's asking, are plastic Ziploc bags inappropriate for seed stores? No, they're, they're good. Um, one of my concerns with uh, sealing seeds too tightly, you know, they are a living thing. Um, you know, there needs to be a little bit of air in there with them. Uh, you know, it's one of the more interesting things I've seen is... Uh, some of these, you know, outfits, seed companies that uh, cater to the preppers and these vacuum sealed seeds. And I'm not sure how long those would last, you know, and, and in a zipper bag, I'm sure there's the amount of air a seed needs is not much. It's probably just fine. And it depends on how long it's going to be in there. How long are you going to be in it? Yeah. yeah. Um, okay, Daniel's asking, can you tell us again which vegetables we need to worry about for cross-pollination? Well, uh, most of your, you know, like all of your cucurbits will cross-pollinate. Um, all of that stuff. Um, okra, I've seen okra. You know, anything with a big showy blossom that, that relies on wind or bees, you know, corn, Cross pollinates real easy. It's really the short list is the is things that do not cross pollinate easy, which is tomatoes, beans, peas, peppers, you know that sort of stuff. Well, that's a good question. I appreciate that you said that it's the the fruit. It's it's, it's the seed that gets cross cross pollinated. You use it the next year, and then your tomato your watermelon tastes like a cucumber. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I've had things cross. There's been a few times that uh, that I've had some really happy cross pollinations. You know, it's like watermelons. Watermelons pretty much only cross with other watermelons out in the garden. And I never met a watermelon I didn't like. <laughs> so, uh, you know, we, we got a, a watermelon. I had some pop up in the row that looked like a Georgia rattlesnake and you cut them open and they were orange inside. So, you know, nothing wrong with that. Right, okay. Um, all right, so um, 
Susan's asking, can you store the seeds in an old medicine bottle, plastic? Oh yeah, that's a great, yeah. You bet. Anything that'll hold them and that you can mark, uh, you know, labeling has, has been one of those things. That's, I, I left that out. Be sure to label them really well because I get seeds mixed up once in a while. And, you know, you put 90 days into growing something, it's nice to get what you thought you planted. Right. Yeah. Okay. So Jan is asking, you say to wait until pods and legumes are dry and will snap before seeds are ready. Does this apply to gathering seeds from leguminous ornamentals such as Cassopanias? No, oh, I'm sure. Of. I am sure. You know, anything that has a seed pod, okra, okra is an example, uh, cotton, you know, anything that has a seed pod like that, the seed pod needs to be fully mature and completely dry to, you know, because it won't be mature until it's completely dry. Um, yeah, it needs to dry. So a concern I have for some of these, like the Castlepania, is um, there's quite a few of insects that like to eat sure. the seeds. And mm -hmm. so if you don't get it before they do, yeah. you'll be growing uh, their larvae inside it. So yeah. Yeah. any tips on when to harvest can you still harvest sure. them when they're kind of still you a little green and um, put them dry in a safer spot or just put a or just put a um a on it. piece of floating row cover over it mm -hmm. then i know people that use uh paper bags for that sort of thing i i just think the floating row cover is easier and it breathes better yes and and slowly here for maria Repeat that list of plants that do not cross pollinate. Okay, the the list the things we mostly grow um, are tomatoes. You know, and anything can cross pollinate. You know, I mean, a, an insect could bite a little hole in it or something. You never know. But the things that rarely cross pollinate are tomatoes, uh, beans, peas and peppers. Oh, and tomatillos, because their blossom they're blossoms. They're a tomato. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And they, and I guess, and I really appreciate your slide. You kind of demonstrated what that blossom looks like. Yeah. That kind of limits the pollination. Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Very good question. Good thing to, to have burned into our brains here and remember that. All right. So, Patrice is asking, I've heard pits can be dried and planted such as plums or peaches. Sure, they're a seed. They're a seed and they will grow. The, the thing with, you know, the, with pits, you know, particularly the, well, any, any, even apple seeds and stuff, you have to remember every seed potentially has two separate parents. So you don't always know unless you hand pollinate, you don't always know what you're gonna get. And in the case of uh, fruit trees, even if you do hand pollinate, you may well wind up with something more closely resembling the rootstock. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, well, you don't want that rootstock. Yeah, unless <laughs> you're gonna graft it. Yeah. yeah, you can always yeah. graft it or, or, yeah. or whatever. But that's a good idea. Um, you could grow those seedlings from the pit and then use yep. that for your seed stock. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, yeah. and then again, that's not hundred percent either, but you know. You, no, no. Yeah. And really if, you know, like if you have a, a super duper uh, apricot tree, for example, uh, or a pear, there's a guy over in Sierra Vista area. We did this with his pear. No, it was unidentifiable, it's ancient. Um, you can just, you can just plant some of the root spot sprouts. You, you can either dig one up with some root on it or if it's coming up off of a fat root, well, you can just clip it and little root hormone, put it in a pot and root it out like you would, you know, a cutting. You can, you can take that root stock and plant it and then take the top spot stock and graft it and reproduce an exact tree if that's what you're after. Very good. Okay, so the next question is from that graph on storing containers, I gather glass is best. So 
do you want to talk about that uh, graph on, on whether you use paper or glass or yeah, you want me to find, find yeah, that again? I, I think there's a lot more to, to jump in to dig into on that. I thought that was yeah. a really good graph. Yeah. And like I say, everybody that makes a graph or, you know, or, or a timeline or anything like that, um, a lot of it is subjective to opinion or just the experiences that that person had. Um, because I, I, to me that the problem with the can or a glass is that it actually goes up instead of down somewhere, you know, see, but it gets the point across. Um, and that's the main thing, different things. I, I have really come to like uh, the plastic storage containers with the snap lid. You can buy them in three packs at the dollar store for dirt cheap. And what's nice about them, they're rectangular. They're efficient, you know, space-wise. And they stack. I mean, they're just handy as can be. And in any case, you know, you're getting germination for a while. And we don't know what what seed you're right there, there's right. some information here we don't yeah. know what the, which seeds they were do, using and uh -huh. we, yeah, yeah. And how we, they how they sealed their containers but it does get the point across yeah. the, the first point being is it's just a decline in germination rate you know um i've i've seen people throwing out seeds that were like three years old because they were outdated and it's like wait a minute just plant a little extra uh, it's good to thin anyway you know, mm -hmm. you just plant it heavy and thin it. And you would expect that if you don't store your seeds in a cool, dry place, you're going to hurt your uh, yeah. the germination, germination rate. Yep. But I still find that if I leave it out on the porch and it's been sitting there a couple of years, I put those seeds in the ground, I usually get something to come up anyway. Yeah, you get something. Yeah. You know. They, it has to be pretty bad to get nothing. And, and then there's years I put, I found some of those seeds and yeah, I got nothing, but that could have been another reason they didn't germinate. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's like when I was moving, what, 13 years ago, I hadn't moved for like 25 years. And uh, I hadn't gotten mercenary when I moved. And I found some, some uh, corn cobs that were, I don't know, 20 some years old. And so I shucked the corn off them and they had been just pretty much in a box full of stuff in a closet unattended for years. And uh, I got probably a 50% germination rate on them. It's like, wow, that was cool. That's, that's really cool. I loved your story about the 700 year old seed. And yeah. Still got 0.5 um, germination rate. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah. How amazing yeah. is that to bring those? Yeah, a fraction old... of a percent, but yeah. he, but he did get enough. There was two, two, two containers and two varieties and they were pretty impressive. One of them was a very large ear and it was pink. From that long ago. That pink, pink. Most beautiful corn I've ever seen. But they've been breeding corn for 10,000 years. Isn't that about right? right? Yeah. 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 Okay. Well, it, you know, I'm growing some uh, melons and stuff in my garden from seed that came from a ruin. Um, you know, years ago, uh, some family members, when they, they moved into the Round Valley area in 1880, and they were ranching and they found seeds in ruins and took them home and planted them. And they've been growing them since they found them. And they gave some to me. And we've been sharing them at the seed library. And I think those people had some pretty good varieties. That's fascinating. So, I love yeah, it. Yeah. OK. Yeah, there's... Next question we got here. Gina says, do you put any of your seeds in the freezer? Uh, not really. I haven't. Uh, I've been tempted a couple of times to do something like that, you know, because I, I was a little concerned that there might be uh, down the road some larva or fungus, but I've just taken to just washing them off and drying them. Yeah, and, and the only reason you do that is when some type of cold stratification is necessary. Right. Of course, um, it's pollen, it's, it's germination. 
Right. And, but you're not going to do it to store it. No, not as storage. I mean, I've done it with apple seeds, Chinese pistache, you know, but never as a storage. And I can't imagine it would hurt a thing as long as you thaw them out, you know, gradually, not just take them out mm -hmm. and stick them in the ground when it's 80 degrees. Okay. All right. Jimmy's asking, I planted radishes and they started out fine. And when they started getting leaves, they looked good. But when, uh-oh, Jimmy, I don't know if I have the rest of your message. Yeah, you'll need to finish that. <laughs> Gina asks <laughs> again. Um, I always hear that ear heirloom, or is it hybrid, won't produce the same plant. Is that correct? The hybrid might produce several different plants. You know, there, there's a lot of different genetics in there that can come forward because I actually had an experience with that. I was able to recycle some uh, coir, and I mean a bunch of it, you know, like a trailer load of it that had been in a commercial greenhouse and they were growing several um, hybrid varieties. And in that coir, I got all kinds of tomatoes and tomato-like plants. Some of them had a little tiny tomato on them that were kind of like about the, oh, maybe as big around as your little finger and an inch long, hard as a rock and nasty tasting. And then some, there was round ones. Anyways, there was a lot in there, a lot of interesting stuff. So stay away from those hybrids. Yes. Well, don't save seeds, you know, yeah, don't save the seed. Um, no, I really appreciated your uh, clothespin technique with the yeah. seeds, with the squash, because um, you only need a few of those, a few of those squash to have right. the seed you need. So you don't have to do that with the entire plant. You just have no, to do it no. with the, the ones you're going to use few. seeds. Yeah. 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 We, we, we grow a pumpkin patch out here and we always save seed from four pumpkins, you know, from four different plants, four different pumpkins, uh, to get some genetic diversity and four, four sugar pumpkins, which are only about a six pound pumpkin has produced enough seed for next year's pumpkin patch. Every gardener in Greenlee County, and enough to share with seed libraries everywhere. I mean, there is a lot of seed in a squash or something like that. A cucumber, you know, the Armenian cucumbers, by the time they're ready for seed, they're enormous. And you've got, you know, probably a cup, cup and a half of seeds from one, one fruit. All right, Roxanne's asking, would you suggest, what would you suggest would be the best place to dry out the seeds? She sees you use paper plates, um, filtered sun, direct sun, dark space, would that be best inside or outside? How long is the average time to dry? Probably depends on type size and- Right, well, um, I always dry stuff in the shade, of course, and I dry it indoors because outdoors there are things that wanna eat them. And uh, indoors, it takes a while longer. But I just, as a rule, I give them a couple of weeks. And, uh, you know, my preferred drying surface is a ceramic plate, but I don't have enough ceramic plates. So I wind up using waxed paper or, or plastic or whatever. Uh, and you'll, you'll be able to tell if they're dry. I mean, you know, just squeeze them, and bend them a little bit. If nothing else, stick them between your teeth. Uh, you can tell, but usually, minimum of two weeks in the shade indoors. Uh, if you're running a swamp cooler, it takes maybe a month. Well, okay, good. Yeah, I remember that swamp cooler. Um, Jimmy's back, he's saying, how can we save seeds from a seedless watermelon? Oh, well, uh, I don't know. <laughs> I think you got a hybrid to be able to make a seedless. Water. It is a hybrid. Yeah, it's, it's I, I forget the whole process. It, it's a, a major production producing the seeds. I personally would never have a seedless watermelon anyways. I consider them a crime against nature. <laughs> I mean, if you can't spit seeds while you're eating watermelon, I mean, come on. <laughs> 
<laughs> okay. Well, Roxanne says thank you for that information. And Jimmy, if you're still with us, you can um, get the rest of your question about the radishes out. But otherwise, we've kind of uh, wound down some of these questions. So this is the time of year to get out there, see what plants did best in your garden and save those seeds. Um, yeah, yeah. And, and while I'm on here, uh, I'm going to make a pitch. Um, I emailed with uh, Mindy Lively. I guess you guys are getting a seed library started over there. Yeah. In Globe. And I would just like to urge the Globe gardeners to save some seeds for the new seed library. Uh, that's where our seed libraries, you know, that's the best deal when gardeners save seeds and share them. And sure. if, if anybody wants to try any weird, unusual varieties, give me a holler because we have all kinds <laughs> of real interesting, really good stuff here that you've never seen. So, yeah. Well, it just makes gardening all that more unique and mm -hmm. yeah, it'll do something different. Yep. Yep. Okay. Well, I think with that, we're going to bring this to a close here. So thank you very much, Bill. Let me get You're our, welcome. our closing slide. Um, we just had our Q&A with, with Bill. So thank you very much. And uh, the next webinar will be on September 23rd. I will, no webinar next week. I've got some other plans. And Rebecca, our colleague, Rebecca Senior will be on. She's with the uh, Horticulture Program at Maricopa County Cooperative Extension. She's a ISA or International Society of Arboriculture Certified Arborist. And we're going to be talking about tree planting and the arborist best management practices. So um, that should be very timely. Very timely for what we're doing. So thank you, everybody. I'm going to go ahead and